So feedback, it's been a while since I've done one of these Q&A videos, so I definitely wanted to get caught up with your comments. And I figured why not just make it into a video? So here we go with another Q&A video. Let's dive in and check out your feedback. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and scroll right through here and answer some random comments. So Appalling68 says, link in the description. Where's the link you mentioned? I will get that added as soon as I can. I apologize. I meant to have that done already. I'm usually pretty terrible about that. I got to get better at it. I definitely plan on getting that added pretty soon. So if not today, then tomorrow, at least by the time you see this video, that would have already been corrected. So uh, John mentions, he says, thank you. Been wanting to try out Arch. With your help, I had no in problems installing. Thank you. So thank you for watching. So Arch Linux is one of those things that has done very well on my channel. So I wanted to refresh that. So what he's referring to is a video that literally came out today where I released the first four parts of my new Arch Linux series, which is just a refresh, nothing new. If you've already installed Arch, then you already know the process, but I wanted to have something new. So that's actually the first comment that I've seen. So I'm glad to see that that was successful. Eric Dangerous says, thank you, Jay. You did a good job by installing it on real hardware and not a virtual computer. And then also another individual says, sarcasm inside. Nice. Someone actually installs on real hardware, not virtual box, like 90% 90, 90 of all the other I use Arch people. So in regards to virtual box, I used to use that for a lot of my videos years ago because I didn't have a better way of recording. So quite a few of my older videos were done that way. I would try the software on physical hardware but I would record it from VirtualBox because that's just the nature of the screen recorder. I had one screen and it was really hard to do that. Now I have a, I'm using um, my friend Tom's setup here. I actually have the same, some of the same setup at home too. I have a dedicated screen recorder, which is a piece of hardware that acts as another display that allows me to record directly off HDMI. So I'm great. I'm glad to finally be in a position where I could do that. You know, it's been my plan for a very long time. Um, so I think they're mentioning that they're happy that I am doing that. Maybe they didn't realize that it used to be that way for me in the past. But that might be why a lot of other YouTubers will use VirtualBox because it's just a lot easier to record. My screen recorder, the one that I have at home and also that I use here at the studio, makes it very easy to do. But, you know, that takes a little bit of money to put into it. So I'm happy to do it this way because I feel like real hardware is the best way to go. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to re-record the Arch Linux series. So it was actually closer to what you would see on real hardware because it was recorded on real hardware as are all of my reviews nowadays and all of my tutorials. Appalling68 again says, my head is swimming here. And I thought my install of Manjaro was complex. And you know, he is 100% correct. Installing Arch Linux is not the easiest installation ever. It's totally true. You know, and it's just one of those things where you get used to it, it becomes easier. I've done it so many times. I mean, I've probably done it 10 times for every video that I've done just to rehearse and practice for the video. I can almost, if not completely, do an Arch Linux install out of memory at this point, which I don't know if that's clever or really sad. But honestly, it is an installation that's not quite that easy, but that was the whole point of the videos is to walk people through it, which I hope is what that's going to accomplish. So since today is the first day of that series, I guess only time will tell how successful that series is in the long run, but hopefully the videos will make it easier for everyone to get that installed. So here we have Justin saying, or asking, why did I go with, you know, Grub instead of systemd boot? And those are two different choices and I've used both and, you know, it's just a matter of preference. I don't really put too much preference into the boot manager because, you know, ideally you should rarely ever see it because you should rarely reboot your machine. However, there is a big difference between the two. And one reason why I might lean more towards Grub is because if you're using something like Time Shift, which allows you to easily create snapshots, which is probably pretty useful to do in Arch Linux, it's not gonna work with systemd boot. It's only going to work with Grub. So if you're using systemd boot, you're basically um, locking yourself out of using Timeship. Now, I don't know if they're gonna get that feature 
or not, I hope they do. But if you're not going to use time shift, then obviously that doesn't matter. It, you know, one preference or over another, I don't really think it makes that big of a difference aside from that, because again, you only see that when you start your computer and then hopefully you're not having to reboot uh, more than you have to, because this is Linux, we shouldn't have to reboot all the time. So that to me is just very low importance, but it doesn't really matter though. If system deboot is something that you prefer, I recommend you use whatever you like better. So Fleefy mentions again about my Arch videos, getting a lot of comments here. A swap partition is necessary for hibernation if you need it. Totally true, but I find that hibernation isn't really that popular nowadays, given that batteries last quite a long time. Uh, suspend to RAM is plenty fine, but I guess if you're using hibernation, that would probably be something that would be required. OS Ubuntu says if they want more people to use Arch, they need to make the installation a bit easier. I agree, 100% agree. The installation is um, quite a quite a, a thing to go through. I mean, it's I, I shouldn't need to create an entire series of videos just for installing Arch Linux, but I did so because I wanted to uh, help people through it. But it is the case, if you want an easy installation or something you can get installed quickly, Arch definitely is not the distribution for you. But I think the benefit of Arch is what you get after the installation because the installation you get is completely yours and something that is specific to you. So I do recommend trying Arch, but if you want something that is easier to install, then probably want to look elsewhere. Moving on from there, this individual asks, so what if I have to reinstall Windows 10 sometime after I set up a dual boot? Will that mess up Grub? Yes, it will. You'll have to reinstall Grub, so you would need to access your Linux machine if you're dual booting with Windows via some sort of live media, and then go ahead and um, reinstall Grub. You can actually look up, I believe it's called Grub Rescue, that you can install that would allow you to recover from that. So um, that is something to keep in mind. And even if you don't reinstall Windows 10, sometimes Windows updates themselves will knock out the bootloader, which is really annoying. I wish Windows and Microsoft wouldn't do that, but they just don't care if you're dual booting, so sometimes that does happen too. So if you are running a dual boot, you probably do want to make sure you have live media available and you know how to install Grub Rescue. It's not hard, but it's just something to keep in mind. And this individual in a comment about my Manjaro open box, uh, 700 megabytes for open box. Well, understand that's the kernel, system utilities, default web browsers, that really adds up and 700 megabytes is not bad at all. Um, that'll fit on a CD and you really can't ask for any more than that. I think that's plenty. Unless you're in an area where that has a very slow connection, I don't really feel like that should be any problem at all. Steve mentions Fedora 30 broke Wi-Fi on a MacBook Pro waiting on the fix, so that's very unfortunate. I gave up on running Linux on MacBooks because they just have never really worked that well for me, but maybe your experience has been different, but for me, I just really haven't found that to be a great experience. And uh, Steve's comment there kind of, uh, you know, makes me think that I'm not alone there. So R.A. Wheeler is referring to the Mate desktop environment. I reviewed Ubuntu Mate. This is actually um, one of my reviews right here, Ubuntu Mate 1804.2. And in that video, I talked about some of the bugs with Mate, and I just find Mate to be a great desktop environment, but what keeps me from using it is the constant bugs that I run into, especially when you're changing resolutions. And this individual is basically mentioning that GNOME 2, which probably mentioning Mate, but Mate is essentially GNOME 2, stinks at scaling in multiple displays, which is true. And there's all kinds of different bugs that I've run into, some of which I kind of forgot to mention in that video. I could probably make a whole video about bugs in Mate. It's just a very buggy desktop environment in my experience, which, which is a shame because I feel like its design and its look and feel is perfect. It's something I really want to use. That's what makes it so frustrating that there's so many problems, especially with the widgets getting rearranged on the top bar, having multiple network managers show up, having applets crash and crash the panels, or shutdown doesn't work because something gets locked when you're trying to log out. It's just a nightmare. I hope they get that desktop environment fixed and put some developer resources in there, but you know, um, RA Realer, I, yeah, I'm having trouble too. Uh, I'm gonna keep checking out Mate though, and as soon as they fix the majority of the bugs or it becomes more usable, I will definitely recreate a video and uh, talk about that for sure. 
Job 8891 says, Ugh, does every laptop have to mimic Apple's design? It's not really the best design in my opinion. I disagree. I don't really feel like the Galago Pro, which is what I reviewed in this video, is mimicking Apple's design. I mean, yeah, it's aluminum, but a lot of laptops are aluminum. And I guess you could argue it's a, a silver or grayish color laptop with a black keyboard. But I mean, that by itself doesn't mean it copied Apple's design. I would say that it's actually quite different, especially given it has a hardware ethernet port. It has actual USB ports on it completely different design in most other respects. So while there's some similarities, I don't agree that it's sim that it's similar enough to be of a concern. Thomas W says, Fedora is way more stable than Ubuntu. I would like to know more about that because I have not found that to be the case. In fact, I have completely found the opposite to be the case. Ubuntu is super solid for me. Fedora, I've always run into issues in one release or another, especially with GNOME software. Now, to be fair, in Fedora 30, I didn't run into any of those issues that I've run into in the past, but it's just one of those things that I've had so many problems with Fedora in the past that I just don't trust it. Whereas with Ubuntu, it has generally been rock solid for me. So this individual referring to my Fedora review mentions that Fedora by default doesn't ship or enable non-open source software. You have to enable them like RPM Fusion, FlatHub, etc. And that's true. And I already knew that. But the thing, the fact of the matter is, I think what, what the person's re referring to is when I mentioned that the repositories are missing certain applications. And that's the hard part when I review distributions because there is no problem in a Linux distribution that you can't fix. So you could make the argument that I shouldn't really find fault with any Linux distribution because it's open source. If there's a problem, you can learn to code and fix it. You can sponsor another developer to fix it for you. So in the regards to repositories or missing software, you can add repositories and then that's not a problem. So there's literally no problem I can bring up in a distribution that can't be solved. So the only thing I can do is judge distributions based on how they are out of the box. So that's my mentality with all of my reviews. I try to change as little as possible because like I mentioned, every problem can be fixed. It's open source. It's just a matter of how much time you'd have to put into it to fix said problem, but you can fix it. Now, in case of the software repositories, um, you know, I mentioned in Fedora that the default repositories have far fewer programs in them than uh, Arch, Debian, Ubuntu. And that's a problem for me because while I certainly can get the software that's missing and there's nothing that I couldn't get, I could even compile software from source to get it installed if I had to. So I definitely can get any piece of software installed. My point though is I shouldn't have to do that. And out of the box, if one distribution has more software available than the other, then you know people are gonna gravitate toward that. Now me being a user since 2002, I could just recompile or you know, compile software from source, add repositories, no problem. A beginner's not gonna to wanna to mess with that. They're just gonna say, you know what, I don't got time for this, and they're gonna move on. So I understand that Fedora wants to stick with non-free software, but I think it's almost to a fault to where they give more of a negative user experience as a result. And I understand why they do it. I feel that morals and principles are very important. But at the end of the day, the users couldn't possibly care less. I, it's sad to say I care. I love free and open source software. I prefer it. But at the end of the day, if you give your users a hard time, regardless of the reason, or you give your users fewer packages to install than other distributions, they will check out the competition. And that's one um, problem I have against Fedora is that I think they do need to relax that a little bit. I mean, yeah, in a perfect world, everything would be free and open source, but there's gonna be some things that aren't. But in my case, even some open source software isn't included either. So even that is an excuse. I'm not really sure why their repositories are smaller than um, the competition, but it is what it is. So Leslie mentions here of uh, some notes about my Fedora 30 review. Um, some things I want to clarify. In this comment, he mentioned since you used a VM that I should try, um, you know, on an actual machine. Actually, this was installed on an actual machine. That was not a VM. I don't use VMs anymore. In the past, I had used that. But um, actually, this was installed on real hardware. And he also mentions that there's other options in the installer that I didn't go over. And, and I am aware of that. Just because I didn't show them in the video doesn't mean that I didn't go over those options. Now, 
I do stand by the problems that I find in Fedora. Again, it's a good distribution, it's just not great. Shad Prince asked, what background was that? Looked like some kind of anime. If you're talking about my lock screen, I think you're probably referring to my Serial Experiments Lane wallpaper. That's a great anime series, not for kids, but um, you know, if you're a mature person, because there's some mature themes in there, I do feel like that's a great anime. It's like one of the best ever. All right, so this individual here, Not Ordinary in Games is a screen name, interesting, says, will you look at the new Oryx Pro? Not telling you to do it, just whether you have that in plans or not. Yes, that is happening. I don't know exactly when that's happening, but I think I should have it in my hands, I'm assuming within two weeks, which considering how much time it takes to film that and uh, you know, get it edited. So I would say two to four weeks, I should have that on my channel. So stay tuned. This person here asked if I could do videos on XCPNG. And the answer is no, I will not be covering that. Uh, my friend Tom Lawrence already does a great job of that. So I am not going to cover that, but definitely check out his YouTube channel. And that's, I'm actually recording this video from the same place. So, um, you know, don't have to go far, but basically check out his videos. He does a lot of videos on XCPNG. I highly recommend that you check that out. In regards to my Galago Pro, this person says, I don't understand how anyone can spend money on a Clevo when a Lenovo T490 is cheaper. It doesn't make sense. So this person is actually wrong in both regards. Now I have done price comparisons of Lenovo and System76 hardware, and they are not different. Um, I like both, so I'm being unbiased here. I love ThinkPads, I love System76 laptops. I own both. So what's in front of me right now is a Lenovo laptop, and I have a System76 machine over there to my left where all my notes are on. So I like both, but to call it like I see it, I've done price comparisons, they are not different. At most, maybe $100 plus or minus in either direction. That's only maybe true that they're cheaper if you find one on clearance, but that's not a fair comparison. So also comparing, also uh, calling a System76 laptop a Clevo is not fair. Is it based on that? Yeah, you know, they do have to base their models on something, but they do a lot of work. They do custom BIOS and all kinds of different things to differentiate themselves from others. And I think that's important to note. And they also design the distribution of Linux that they ship on there. But the most important thing is they support Linux. Now, it's not recommended that you use anything but a machine that was born to run Linux. And the reason why is because compatibility cannot be guaranteed. Now, here I am. I'm using a Lenovo right here. Obviously, this laptop shipped with Windows, so I'm a hypocrite by saying that, but I'm actually not because before I bought this machine, I researched every single component in it to make sure that it was going to be compatible before I bought it. But with System76, you don't have to do that. And that's the main benefit. If I call you know, Lenovo and I say, hey, I'm having a problem with this machine, they're basically not gonna support me unless I run uh, Windows on it, so I'd have to put Windows back on there. If I have to send this back in to get a depot repair, I gotta reload Windows on it, otherwise they'll probably blame me for the problem, even though technically it's not legal to blame that on someone for that reason. But you know, you go through those things when you're dealing it with a computer that ships Windows. You don't deal with that with System76. So I think that's a really important distinction, but even if you take that out of the equation, they do make customizations to their firmware and to the systems that other manufacturers don't do. So to call that um, basically just a Clevo, I think is really not taking into consideration all the hard work that System76 does to differentiate themselves from others. Anjan says, ask System76 to come to India. I don't have any pull, but I really wish that they would ship in other countries. That's a very common complaint against System76 is that they don't ship to places that you know companies like Lenovo and do ship to. That's a problem. Uh, I, yeah, totally is a problem. Depending on where you are in the world, you might not even have access to System76 hardware, and that's a shame. But unfortunately, I don't have any pull to get them to do it. I'm sure they want to do it, but unfortunately, you know, it is what it is. They are where they are, so I hope that they do expand in the future. So this individual, on a comment of one of my hardware reviews, um, saying that it's very dismissive to just say that all laptop audio sucks and to compare it accordingly and that it's doing a disservice, but 
I disagree, and the reason is, if I don't hear a difference, then I can't really tell you about a difference. I'm not an audiophile or a sound engineer. I'm not really qualified to accurately judge speakers like an a audio engineer would be able to do. I find that every speaker that I've used, or you know, internal speakers from all laptops I've used, they all suck, every model I've ever used. And, and I agree, he's basically saying, you know, there's no bass that's to be expected. Well, I agree, but it, it is what it is that I just feel like none of them are that great. And um, I couldn't even notice the difference between one or another. So if I can't notice a difference and I'm not really going to be able to tell you what the difference is, that's just not something that I'll be able to do. So Kevin brings up a point in regards to my 1904 review where I said that basically nobody should use it, or at least most people shouldn't use it. He says that he doesn't understand the advice not to upgrade. Yes, the support lifecycle is shorter, but by the time it runs out, the next point release will be out. And that's the problem. So with non-LTS releases, they're only supported for about six months, or excuse me, nine months. Six months, the new version will be out. So it is true that by the time the support runs out, the next version's already released. And you know, you could even wait a month for the bugs, if there are any, to be ironed out in the next release before you upgrade. So that is true, but the reason why I have to stand firm on my opinion is, what if you don't like the next release? What if it you know, has a new version of GNOME that removes some features that you didn't want removed? What if it's unstable on your hardware and some of these bugs never get fixed? So what happens if the next release of Ubuntu after the one you're on isn't something that works well? You have no choice but to upgrade to it because you have no support. It's either be okay with the fact that you won't get updates anymore or move to the next release. You don't have the option to stick around. With LTS, you can stay on the release for you know a year or more after the next LTS release comes out and still be in good shape. So if the next release isn't in good shape for you or isn't working right, you're not forced to move. So what's your alternative then if you're running non-LTS and the next version isn't something that works well for you or has some major downside you're not okay with? Your only option then is to either just use the next version anyway despite it not working well or just downgrade to the previous LTS release or maybe try a different distribution. So that's why I feel like it's uh, important not to use non-LTS releases unless you have a very special reason why you want to. For example, maybe the LTS release doesn't work for you. In which case, what other option do you actually have? So there probably could be some reasons to use non-LTS. But generally speaking, the reason why there's no reason to upgrade is generally because the new kernel and driver stack will be backported to LTS, to the current LTS release. So that benefit, you don't have anymore because you'll get that anyway in LTS. So unless there's a very big reason to upgrade, there's really no reason that I think not to because the risk is greater. Like I mentioned, maybe it doesn't work right. Um, I've seen releases of Ubuntu that'll break very important things like in the past, such as game pads. I literally updated to a version of uh, a non-LTS one time, game pads don't work. So if you wanna play games and use a game pad, you're not because it, it won't work. I've seen another one where Steam controller support was broken in, in, in Steam. So these problems do happen, and I just don't see a reason to get a stable LTS distribution, then upgrade to a non-stable one, and then you know deal with all the rough edges. And for what? If there's no uh, really big feature that uh, you could benefit from, then um, I think that is just a waste and probably something you should avoid to begin with. And here I have somebody asking about fingerprint drivers and things like that. Do they come with it? Um, so basically when you install a distribution of Linux, all those drivers are going to be built in. Uh, there's gonna be some things that aren't supported. Fingerprint readers on Lenovo is uh, you know very common. I often don't see that working. So that's a downside, but all those drivers are built in. The only exception might be if you have like a gaming card like Nvidia, you might have to install a different driver, but you just basically open the software utility, I believe it's called software repositories. I'm the, I don't have Ubuntu installed right now, but basically there's a driver manager, you just open it up and it just has an option to download whatever you need. So that's usually pretty easy to get up and running with whatever drivers, but 90% of the time or more, you don't need to actually install anything. You far less frequently, you'll have to install drivers in a Linux distribution than any version of Windows. And I have someone here on the bottom asking, 
Um, you know, since I mentioned Debian 10 is coming, can I make a video showing the full installation process? And um, yeah, as a matter of fact, I will do that. And not only that, but I am going to do an entire series on Debian. I don't know when I'm gonna do it because Debian 10 has to come out. There's no reason for me to create a Debian 10 series right now when 10 is just around the corner. So I'm kind of waiting for that to come out. And as soon as it does, I'm going to start drafting a tutorial series and I will make some videos on that, so stay tuned. So there you go, guys. I hope uh, this was fun for you. I love interacting with your feedback. You know, sometimes I agree, sometimes I disagree, but I love all of your comments and appreciate each and every single one of you watching my videos. Um, you are what makes this channel a success for me. You guys are awesome. So go ahead and leave me some comments below with some of the video topics you would like to see me tackle. And I might just make a video about that. So if there's some content you wanna see, definitely let me know. Um, with that said, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching my video. I really appreciate it. If you wanna help me out, make sure you check out the description below this video where you'll find links to my latest book, Mastering Ubuntu Server, second edition, as well as my Patreon page. If you like this video, be sure to click that like button and share it on Twitter or any other social media network. And be sure to subscribe so you'll be the first to see my latest videos as they're uploaded. Thanks again.